So, hello everyone, uh, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Digital Adoption Show. I'm your host, Sumit Bedi, a senior product designer at Wattfix. And today we are diving into one of the hottest debates in learning and development. That is AI in LD. Is it just a fad or the future of learning? Now, AI has been making waves across industries, but when it comes to LD, is it truly revolutionizing the way we learn? Or is it just another trend that might fizzle out? To help us unpack this topic, we have brought together two experts in the field who are at the cutting edge of learning design and AI-driven solutions. Our first guest is Hosam El Nagar, Senior Consultant in L&D, EdTech, and Gen AI at Altshift Lab. Hosam has a wealth of experience in instructional design and has led transformative initiatives. Hosam is not only an expert in instructional design, but has also explored how AI intersects with other areas like music and journalism. He's here to share his insights on the role of AI in shaping the future of learning. Joining Hosum is Simon Leverton, L&D Digital Design Consultant at Sigma Connected Groups. Simon is known for his creative approach to digital learning, whether it's using Lego stop motion videos or integrating AI enhanced learning experiences, Simon brings a unique perspective to making learning engaging and fun, whether it's gamification, simulations, or music-based learning. Hosum, Simon, we're thrilled to have you both here. Thank you. So before we dive in, why don't uh, you share with our audience a bit about your journey in the LND space? We'll start, Hosum, with, with, we'll start with you. Sure, I, I come actually from television news and I moved into media development about 11 years ago. And that's when I started looking at, you know, developing people. And I, the organization I was working for did not have any anything digital at the time. So I, you know, I thought it's about time to explore what, you know, what was possible, uh, especially since we worked with uh, journalists all over the world. And and I got a wonderful opportunity and, and the backing to kind of build something from scratch. And, and at the time, the learning experience was what we could see was quite flat in terms of e-learning had a bad name and stuff like that. So we had a you know, great opportunity to kind of invent, uh, reinvent things and, and experiment. And, and it was a journey that I enjoyed very much. And I became very passionate about sort of the way that technology connects with, with, with learning and, and the development. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that. In fact, for all the people who are listening in, I also read one of the articles uh, by Hosom, which is made by human marker. Like, do we now have a need to create a made by human marker with all the AI stuff around us? So we'll also talk about that. But thank you, Hosom. Glad to have you on the show. Fantastic. Simon, what about you? How's, how's your journey been? I think mine's really, mine's like the normal approach. So I started off as I was a, a team leader. And I went on a training course and the training manager says, do you want to become a trainer? And I went, yeah, all right. And then, so that was 20, basically that was 20 years ago. So I, I ended up delivering, as we all do, inductions. And then I didn't really get into e-learning until probably 2012, but, it, but I was more content design. I wasn't actually using Captivate or Articulate or anything like that. I was just kind of creating videos and just just looking at what was around and looking actually looking at the television and seeing how how they do stuff and saying how can I put that into learning how can I make people engaged by what we're doing and that's pretty much what I've done for the last yeah to say 20 years till now and then get excited by the new stuff that appears in the world it's uh you go oh look at this let's press it let's press buttons Wow, so that was really me. That, that that's yeah. awesome, and it resonates so well uh, with with my journey when I started also as a as a corporate trainer, and then I was like, hey, I also want to control what is uh, being presented on the screen. Who does that? And mm. they were like, oh, it's an e learning department, so I have to get to then switch to an yeah. instructional designing job. But but amazing. Uh, so so those are great stories. And now that we have set the stage, let's get into the heart of our discussion today. We are focusing on three core questions around AI and L and D. Now, first up with AI enabling real-time learning and personalized feedback. How do you see AI transforming how LND teams handle upskilling and continuous learning? Can you share examples where AI has noticeably improved learning effectiveness? Uh, Hosum, let's let's get things off with you. 
Sure. I mean, the, the first thing, I, I think it's important to be mindful that we are still in a sort of discovery phase where there's a lot of experimentation going on. There are so many possibilities. And, but, you know, all of these things are happening all over the place and, and, uh, and, and, and still making their way into like the mainstream platforms, which is what, you know, the L&D sector uses. And, and you, need, you need kind of the, the features and, and these things to be connected to your HR ecosystem and data to really make effective use of them. So, but, but having said that, I mean, there's already a lot that has, you know, has started appearing on, and, you know, on different sides and the content creation side on the, the user interaction. But the thing that really excites me the most at the moment and, and actually caught my, my eye because of the pain that I felt about this very issue is on the side of the, the intelligence, the skills, intelligence, and, and, and sort of competence intelligence where, you know, creating something like a, a skills taxonomy or competency mapping is something that uh, I attempted to do a couple of times in my previous organization. And it, and it is a, you know, it's a very difficult process, especially if you don't, if there are no libraries out there, like skill taxonomies for your, you know, the roles that you're trying to map or the skills that you're trying to map or that kind of stuff. And, and, and it's really complex work, but there are already platforms that have kind of are, are leveraging AI and, and, and you can, you know, you can actually really streamline the process and do a lot of the groundwork using these platforms and making it suddenly no longer such a difficult thing to do. And, and, and so like, you know, this, a small L and D team can now Oper, you know, adopt this this possibility, and and be able to then leverage you know the real recommendation system, the power of the recommendation system, aligning content based on you know the 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 specific skills that it addresses with the specific skills that you know you want to develop as an organization. You can look at your whole workforce uh, from a capabilities perspective. And and kind and kind of you know it's almost like having this dashboard where you help you know the help the organization build the the capabilities that it needs the most at the you know at the right time and also serve the employees and and their ambitions in a way that is is sort of practical and trackable. So it's a little bit like this ideal world that is suddenly looks in theory possible, but of course there's you know tons of caveats. But that's that's what I'm at the moment. I, I'm really I see right now as being the most exciting thing. Well, thanks, thanks, Ozan. I I completely agree. I think first off, we do not even have L and D strategists even consider creating competency frameworks because it's too cumbersome or too difficult. But I I think now with AI in the in the in the picture, that sounds like it is not even possible. But you can actually do it the right way. So perfect. Simon, I know you have worked on some creative AI-driven learning projects yourself. Can you walk us through one of those experiences and how it made a difference? Yeah, I kind of do look at um, more design. So I look at it as my journey with it started with, I saw something on YouTube and went, oh, that looks quite good. And which has pretty much been my whole career in L&D. Oh, like, oh, this PowerPoint looks good. That's how long ago it is. Oh, well, how does PowerPoint work? Let's press this. What's Google? So it's, I'm there with this, this AI appears and I'm like, well, let's have a play. What can we do? And I'm, I was looking at the voices because the, a lot of the content I create has to have a voiceover. And then I've got to try and find somebody within the business to, to do the talking. And then it's like, matching up dives and it's just the amount of time it takes just to do that and then just getting them to send me one minute of their voice putting it into 11 labs mm -hmm. having a bit of a tweak and then creating a whole wrath of, of people's voices within the business and and having voiceovers from within the business but making sure the script is right because the biggest problem we've found is people just use ai and go oh it's a voice and they put a an awful script together forgetting that when when you get an i'm going to say a normal human so that's not the right word but when you get a human to speak to they'll use they'll use the the tone of voice and all that emphasis to make it work 
AI can't do that. You've got to put that in. You've got to write the script for it to do it. And then suddenly go, well, that's not AI. And I've actually done competitions at work where, so, so uh, I also do podcasts and I've, I've been doing them for about seven years where I edit this particular person. So I had so much content of theirs and scripts that I was able to take it and create his voice in the 11 labs. And then we did a competition, which one is Phil? And actually, a lot of the people going, it's number three. So now it's number one. That's the real Phil. That's the AI version. So that's that's where it's got me at the moment. I'm creating content with voices. And a good example, I did a financial crime. So I better kind of, if I rewind, how e-learning was up until me joining the company was click next. So it was a load of writing yeah. and they click next. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's kind of how it's got to, life's got to be better than this so i created a whole story in fi financial crime using beyond created all the videos of the characters created the scripting used the voices and created a 30 minute e-learning package which took them through all of financial crime with a story with the questions and it was just so exciting because it wasn't like the normal the normal thing we produce where you just have to read loads and click it it was just so interactive and people loved it because it, it kind of they went back. That's always a good sign is when people actually go back. It's it's something they've got to do, but then they actually go back and watch it again. You go, come on. So awesome. that's my journey with it. <laughs> wow. So thanks, thanks a lot for sharing. I think I think I also remember when you know those learners come back and say that, hey, I just love that character in your e-learning. And where is it coming back again? So I yeah. see eight years or nine years ago, we had to like, you know, source a lot of content to just make that one emotion one character but now with, yeah. with ai i'm assuming you know it has fastened the process would you would you agree yeah i, I mean it the whole the whole thing is a lot faster so I, I i think if we just start with creating a script that sounds lifelike you can you can create yeah. that within a minute and that would have took two or three days just to, to to i mean they're still tinkering and you kind of go actually i wouldn't say it like that and they wouldn't say it like that so it's it's everything you put into it that makes it great, but you, you, you're saving days of work. So which means you can focus on how it looks. So it, it's gonna it's gonna look really good and it's gonna have the impact you want because you can always have the impact. That's the first thing we look at, but it's how it looks because it's yeah, that for me is I'm sorry, I get too excited by it. That for me is what it's been like. It's kind of oh, I've saved myself, well, not save myself a day, but I can focus on this as opposed to writing the bit I don't like. That, that's the bit for me. Perfect. Moving on. So we have talked about the amazing stuff AI can do, but AI also brings, you know, its own set of challenges. So what key barriers do l and teams face, you know, in fully adopting AI? And how can they overcome these challenges while avoiding that shiny object trap? Hosam, I would love to know your thoughts on this. All right. Now, I, <clears throat> that's a, a very good question. And I can't say I have the the perfect answer. So I think with technology, it's always important to step back and sort of ask yourself, you know, what is it that you're trying to do in the first place? And, 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 and where is the, you know, where's the, what are the obstacles? And, and then you can really see where AI can make a difference. So when, when, I mean, as an example, when, when chat, when I first discovered chat GPT, the first thing that came to my mind is that, you know, could we do something, could we replace the multiple choice format? It's, you know, it, it's, it was always so, it's, it's always limiting when you're designing an experience that, you know, you always have to, you know, put, put things in multiple choice or whatever, because that's, you have no way of marking a person or giving them feedback otherwise in the same way that you in, in a workshop you know you you wouldn't ask a multiple choice question you would ask an open question and then give somebody feedback so great you know yes you you can technically you can do it maybe the platforms don't immediately support it but you know if you use apis and you know so testing that you can engineer for the conversation to bring in a large language model like ChatGPT or whatever to process the question and, and provide the right feedback. Now that's a lot of work. It adds resource and costs and, and so on. Is it, you know, is it worth doing for all your courses and so on? You know, is the benefit to the users worth the cost and effort involved? So in general, you know, 
right now you would say no because if it was in the platform it's great you could just use that instead of using the multiple choice feature but but actually there might be a place where it is useful and that's like you know like simon was mentioning there the example of a scenario learning experience you know that if you can transform a scenario experience from a situation where you are interacting with the scenario by responding to multiple choice to some kind of a role play game where you actually converse where maybe you can have some some you know where maybe in some cases it's important to kind of feel the the tone and 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 or maybe you are dealing with a temperamental character in the story you know these things are actually possible with using AI and that's transformative and in something like that yes it would be worth investing in the time and the effort because it's you know it's transformative and actually can empower that learning experience and make it more memorable more effective so you know I, I would say it's important to be curious to try things out and experiment and and sort of play but you know you have to be sure that you can see the benefits and and be aware you know that ai introduces unpredictability it's not transparent in terms of like what you put in what you get out you know there may be some issues it might you know require a lot of processing and data issues and and so on so it you know it's easy to run for it that's why i think obviously people will tend to wait for features to be available in established platforms that would be easier and safer to do rather than you know try to kind of build things on the side wow a follow up on that um, i have read your uh, article on you know whether we are losing that human touch or would people be willing to read an article that's completely generated by ai so according to you where should that balance be when it comes to lnd should it be that ai should just be leveraged for you know simplifying complex tasks or bring in efficiency but at the same time you know we should be at the at the driving seat what are your thoughts on that that's a, a really huge question and i would say, i would say in general of course i mean if you know, I I think a lot of people, if you told them, hey, here is a book, this was written by AI. I mean, I don't know, maybe attitudes will change, but I think, you know, my personal attitude would be like, well, why should I read that? You know, that's crazy. But there are, I mean, inevitably, it's already happening that people are, you know, say, going to ChatGPT and saying, I want to write a message that says X, Y, Z, you know, and then brup, and it comes up and then they take it and maybe edit it slightly and they send it. And so we, we are, we're getting to an area where the AI is becoming like an interface, a tool for communication, for, for learning as well. So some people will, I mean, I, I do it myself. Actually, I've been experimenting recently with Google's notebook is called LM or something like that, where, you know, so I've, I've been sent like these documents, these papers, who which I normally would put on the side and wait for a gap to kind of skim through or whatever, because I'm interested in the content. But it's much easier just put it on AI and then, you know, you can get it to generate for you a quick summary or like as as the as the google I think it's called notepad lm or whatever it it creates a little podcast a short like eight minute pod and that's you know so i i kind of do that listen to it and i quickly get a gist of what's in the in the content and and i like listening i listen to podcasts and so on so i think the you know i i'm not in a position not for taking a strong stance but i think you have to be transparent you have mm-hmm. to let people know when you're using AI and and to try to use it to make like, you know, so I think Simon is spot on with this idea of it's really why you're using it and, and to kind of create good communication, great experiences as the reason. Very well. Awesome. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Uh, Simon, have you seen teams getting caught up with AI as just a, you know, fancy new tool or a trend without actually understanding its impact? You see... In this situation, even though I'm in a team of, I think, eight at the moment, eight or nine, Mm -hmm. everything that I'm doing on AI is kind of under the radar. So we're a bit fearful 
of it. They're scared of it. With my team, not so much, but the overall company gets a bit fearful and kind of go, oh, what are you doing? And so we, so for example, the meetings on Teams and we can kind of take it and we can edit it down. This is the summary. Get your transcript and turn that into a summary. So yeah, somebody hasn't got to sit and go through it saying, this is what you've got to do. This is what you've got to do. And go, oh, that's too scary. We can't have that. So it is fear. It's But like I say, it, it's everything I've ever come across throughout my career is fear. PowerPoint was a fear. Well, we've got flip charts. Yeah. Why would I need to use PowerPoint? Uh, you know, this is, I'm going to use, I'm going to use the internet to search stuff. You've got books. What, 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 what is it? So everything takes time. And it's, I think this is the first time I've kind of jumped on something and, and really kind of ran with it and saying, actually, it is going to save us some time. It's going to, and that's what it is. And it is right about not using it for everything. It's something brilliant to play with and it, you get some great results. And sometimes you need this. This is what, this is when, when we're delivering training courses, it needs to be this human element completely. And, but I, I can, I can't say highly enough of how I've loved using AI just for creating something different and engaging people. And then just, and, and, and there's actually a little bit of seeing the fear on the face is quite good. Going, this is AI. You know, oh, you know, we, we've been hacked. And I think where we're talking about using, especially an articulator, where we can, the problem we've got is firewalls. So that's been stopping me kind of really integrating it into e-learning. Kind of, because I, I would have loved this idea of a character that you can interact with and chat with and Ah, we. I tried that and that went out the window within like two hours when they realised how good our firewall was and nothing would nothing would allow it to go through <laughs> on, onto the phone without, you know, no, you can't do that. But then luckily what, what we have got is somebody in, in the IT team is now creating their own AI version because you can create your own. It's just, it takes a long time. So maybe one day I'll be able to do that, but firewalls are a pain for me at the moment. So I'll just, I'll just stick to the simple stuff. I can relate, Simon. Thanks a lot again for sharing. A follow-up to that, Hosum, do you feel we can have some indicators when it actually comes to showing the value of AI and L&D? What kind of indicators or metrics can we you know, look at to show that AI is actually creating an impact, be it in the efficiency or the quality of the output that is, that is coming? So I think you you know the, the, the indicators are the same whether you're using ai or not you know you've got if if you're uh, an organization you know you are looking at what you're trying to achieve and what indicators are for that you know whether it is greater customer satisfaction or more sales or a certain change in you know attitude or uh, capability or, you know what ai can do is help you measure in a more nuanced way, for example, a really obvious thing is the analysis of text or, you know, looking at patterns or finding what, what are the things that are impacting in, in a kind of in set collection of data and so on. So, so I, I don't think that you need to change your indicators in terms of the impact necessarily, but you do, you might want to have some kind of way of checking on the side effects of AI, perhaps. I'm glad Simon mentioned the Google searching or, or the internet searching, etc. Before that, I mean, now, you, you know, like, it's like when you, when you take up a new capability, technological capability, like Google search and availability of the internet 24-7, you let go of maybe a skill that you had before. So maybe a very simple example is finding your way in the streets. I, I noticed I'm a Gen X, so I used to have to find my way to get from A to B in many different ways. I have a good sense of direction. I know where I am, but I'm noticing that some people, you know, I mean, I've noticed with myself that if you, if you kind of rely on GPS, et cetera, you kind of, you, you go to one place once or twice, but you might not remember how to get there again because you still have to go back to the phone. But if you have to figure out another way, you learn the, the place. And it's a bit the same with AI. So when AI is going to uh, be used more and more in, in our writing, in our content creation, our course creation, in the mapping of capabilities, in managing the distribution of content, 
in working out the employee's needs and allocating content, the more you hand that over to AI, the less you have maybe an intrinsic or deep understanding of what's going on. And the more you're not sure if, you know, something is maybe being repeated or because you can see if you use AI to summarize text, for example, some of the summaries are quite bad because it is missing some things that if you had read the article, you would have considered to be important or would have caught your attention. But the AI completely misses them. And but it's not its fault. It's it's just the, the way it is. So if you extrapolate that to important you know, allocation processes or however you're involving AI in your system, you are introducing potentially a dark part as in a, a part where you're not fully aware what's exactly going on. And, and maybe if you were, you would do things differently. And that's where maybe as well, you need to think of how do you check the impact of AI or cross-check it or triangulate to just make sure that you're not also introducing something bad. That, that's a really insightful point. Thanks a lot for sharing. Simon, I would, I'd like to move on to the next question, which is implementing AI isn't just about adding new tech, right? It's also about change management. It's also about digital transformation. So what critical questions uh, should learning leaders ask uh, you know, before they adopt uh, AI? So, yeah, the, so the training question is, what, what do we want to achieve by doing this? That is, is the first question we need to ask. Mm -hmm. it, I think it is, look, I think AI is just a marvelous tool, but we use it. So can I talk about how I also use it? Because I think this is, so what I've found with it is because it's, so I've got autism, by the way, so that in case you're, oh, really? So I've got autism. So I use it as a kind of a, a tool for me because it helps. How would I say this? How would I say this in, in real life? But also I look at it and say I have an idea and my ideas aren't always suitable or acceptable. AI is a really good tool for asking, is this all right? Because I use, I, and that's another re, a way of using it is going, what, what would the, is this all right? It's not bad, is it, if I say this or do this? And, it, and it's quite blunt. And at the moment, I'm going through a redundancy process. So it's been really good for that, saying, this is happening. How does this work? And, it's, and as long as I put the right information in, it's been quite, it's a good coach. I can, it's, it's uh, weirdly, it's a, it's a, it's a really good thing to relate to. Now, but that's diff using it differently. Businesses, may not want it like that. They want to, because they like control. And AIs, if they let people like me onto AI, I'm going to lose control. I might do something bad and share so much information that I'm not allowed to. And I think that's, again, what they could be worried about. It's a difficult one. And I don't know if the, if the answer is right yet, because I'm pretty sure if we were doing this 10 years ago with whatever new came out then we'd be having the same conversation maybe we need to have it in another 10 years and go well it's just natural isn't it this is what happens there'll be something we'll have androids running L &D. I don't know how it will work by that point but there'll be there'll be something new and something scary that we kind of go ah oh, like that and make noises Sorry, I, I got overexcited there again, didn't I, with my cup of coffee? Oh, no, but but thanks uh, thanks for sharing, uh, Simon. I think it also resonates with, uh, you know, how I've seen your work where you, uh, you know, talk about how a same design can actually cater to different needs, be it like the same, you know, video can be converted to a PDF or uh, e-learning, you know, and just for the different learner needs. And AI actually can create that impact, bring that value. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, well, I mean, very quickly on that, it's because I'm working across in the UK and South Africa. So what, what it's really good for is kind of go, I'm aiming at an audience that's 18 to 35, a mixture of UK and South Africans. How would this, how does this need to sound? How do I engage them in that material? And so again, that's a, I would never... For me, five years, how would I do that five years ago? But now I've kind of got this tool that kind of allows me to kind of go, is this how you communicate? Brilliant. So I'm having more impact because what we have, what I have found and what I notice is because we are working in the in South Africa, the UK tend to just do it. This is how we do it in the UK. And I know that's not going to have the impact that we want to have in South Africa. So we need to kind of understand how they work.
and we can we could talk to them and and that to me is is a really good way of using it. That that was really insightful. Yes, yeah. Hosam, I'd like to ask you what should what should leaders be considering before making that leap to the air? Yeah, no. So we obviously already talked about you know what why you want to use it or where you know where is it that it can really firstly. But there are a few things to consider, of course, like copyright and data. Are you using anybody's content? Could you get in trouble? because of that or you know the ethical side but also you know are you you know are you protecting your data or your employees data and all of all of all of these things uh, we talked about the potential you know issues of dependency on the technology and and you know and and so like the the level of control that you need to have that you need to maintain to you know not to hand everything over to a third party and be dependent on how they move things, how they shift things, especially if it's something critical to your process. So there is that whole side, but then obviously there is the adoption side and the the typical, you know, all the issues around change management, but chief amongst them, like, you know, Simon talked about a lot is this idea of the you know, people's resistance and fears and justified fears, of course, you know, can you, can you sell the, so the AI to each stakeholder, you know, you have to make the argument to each stakeholder to show them, you know, what is, what's the benefit of the, of, of AI for them. And, and I think the, the point about the, the collective resistance, I think if, you know the fact that companies are careful not to let people loose on AI. Maybe that's that can be actually, if if they were giving people the opportunity to play with AI, to to use it individually, to do things like you know increase their productivity, experiment, play, or you know in in some way, then people I find that people who have a, who have had the opportunity to interact with AI tend to be more understanding of what it is, what its capability right now. They might not be as fearful as, you know, the hype, the, the hype and the counter hype, you know, and, 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 and they would be more excited and interested to use it as kind of a partner rather than, you know, this big fear that it's going to replace you in your job can i just i've got one more little thing that's just you made me think of something another barrier that comes in is you're sometimes you're accused of being lazy by using ai so that 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 was something i did have to deal with well you're just using ai you you're not you're not doing your job properly and it's like well actually (laughs) i'm using this to enhance what i do but that was another barrier that we, we were facing that to kind of well, this is how I've used it and this is what we've produced. So I'm asking it questions and then this is what I've produced based on that. So it's not doing everything for me. I'm just using it as a prompt. And that that was a that was a big thing. They just think what well, people could think, well, you're lazy. You're using that, which then led me to the Google kind of situation. I say, well, you use wow. Google, don't you? Yes. And I think this also reminds me of one of, with one of the lines that you know, I read in uh, Hosom's article. It says that AI should be used to serve a purpose and not become one. So I think, you know, I would <laughs> like to wrap that with, with this statement. But amazing. I think you've both given us a lot to think about. And thank you for those invaluable insights. It's very clear that uh, AI has the potential to reshape learning, but it's actually up to us to harness you know, that potential in meaningful ways. So a huge uh, thank you to uh, Hosam and Simon for joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Um, if you're as inspired as I am, uh, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the Digital Adoption Show for more inspiring stories. Uh, thanks again, uh, Hosam and Simon. It was a pleasure uh, having you both on the show today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. 